If you're visiting us for the first time, you came in the middle of a series we have called Good Nights. Why? Because we say that every night. Have a good night. But how many of us are really having good nights? How many of us are, uh, on the contrary, staying awake? Why? Because we have insomnia, because we have anxiety, because we are depressed, because we're overanalyzing and thinking things and worrying about tomorrow. And so we, have, uh, we are attacking it head on. It, it, spiritually, I know that there are issues sometimes clinically. Uh, I am not a clinical psychologist. I'm just a Bible preacher, so that's my disclaimer. I'm clarifying there. Now, don't take that lightly because the Bible, the Word of God is alive. It is powerful. It never returns void. Uh, but I am giving you a spiritual perspective. Even, even uh, you know, psychologists and even uh, physicians will say that there is a, there's a mental element. Uh, in fact, all of these things, anxiety, depression, worry, they're called mental illnesses. And so uh, we, we are thankful that mental to us means spiritual. Because if we can submit our minds to Christ, as, as the Apostle Paul says, then we are going to overcome so there's good news for you this morning. If you've been battling one of these things, if you've been staying up at night and you're tired of it and you want to get your rest, we are believing that as you hear the truth of God for your life, the truth will set you free. Amen? Today's message I've simply titled, Don't Worry. Turn to someone and tell them, stop worrying. Perhaps you went to bed one of these nights and you were thinking of having a good night. Then all of a sudden, it's 3 a.m., your eyes are wide open. You're asking yourself questions. How many, how many of you ask yourselves questions in the middle of the night? You know, in a study, Psychology Today compiled a list of the top five questions people ask themselves in the middle of the night. This is going to be interesting. See if you identify with one of these. The top five questions people are asking themselves in the middle of the night. These are the questions that are keeping you up, that are stealing your sleep. What do I want from my life? That's number one, or some variation of it. Number two, am I doing the right thing? Number three, what do other people think of me? And, and, and I know it sounds uh, perhaps a little bit shallow, but, but if we're honest with ourselves, we do care uh, sometimes too much about what other people think of us. And sometimes it's fair. I mean, you, you, want, you want to know that, uh, your boss thinks well of you, you know, and, and sometimes you're worried about your performance at work and you're thinking, what, is, what, what did they think about my performance? What does my, my boss think about me? Number four, where am I going in life or what on earth am I here for? And number five, where am I going to park at Vital Church on Sunday morning? <laughs> that one's a joke. The other four are real, okay? Uh, but many other studies suggest that the greatest source of stress for the average American is work. Somebody shout work. work. Because, you know, work kind of entails so much of, of who we are and what we do. In fact, many of us, when people ask us, hey, who are you? We'll answer with our, with our job description. <laughs> you know, hey, who are you? Well, I'm an engineer or I'm a teacher. But no, 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 I, I didn't ask you what you do for a living. I asked you who you are. But see, we are so wired to believe that what we do is so tied to who we are that we answer that way. We answer with our profession. And work worries us because that's where our sustenance comes from. And so we need, we need to pay the bills and we need to put food on the table and we got to clothe the kids and, and we got to pay the house and we got to pay the, the insurance and the car. And, and, and so work worries us a lot. But one of the things that we've discovered in this series is that the number one source of stress is not work. In fact, it's worry. And this is how I'll prove it to you. Work is not keeping you up at night. Worry is. In fact, you work hard. Work prepares you to have a good night. Work prepares you. You should be sleeping like really deep and snoring really loud because you worked really hard. It's not a work that is keeping you up. In fact, it is worry. Now, Paul, who writes the greatest literary work concerning anxiety, had a lot to worry about. He even admits to experiencing sleepless nights. Yet he writes in Philippians 4, verse 6. Remember we told you this last week. This is the most highlighted verse of the Bible. The Bible is the most read book in the world. And this is the most read or highlighted verse in the Bible. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Is this even possible? Because he, he seems to not be giving us any wiggle room. 
He's saying, he's not saying worry less. He's not saying worry about less things. He's saying don't worry about anything. But yet he says that he himself has gone through many adversities, that he himself has had sleepless nights. So I would suggest to you that he's not against concern. He's against, he's against that uncontrolled worry that keeps you up, that steals your peace. He's against the perpetual anxiety that the enemy wants to convince you of that you are destined to. Max Lucado says it this way, the presence of anxiety is unavoidable, but the prison, prison of anxiety is optional. When you consider Paul's letter to the Philippians as a whole, you would think that he is sitting in a resort in Dubai somewhere, but no, he's in a prison. He is 60 years old. He's been a Christian for 30 years. He has been stoned. He has been whipped. He has been shipwrecked. He has been ill. He has been near death several times. He is being persecuted. He leads several churches, and he carries all the weight and all the, the, the stress of it. And not only that, he's in the middle of a prison. He is bound in shackles and chains. He is awaiting to appeal his case before Caesar. Now, this Caesar is known to kill believers in order to gain the favor of his citizens. And guess who is the most famous believer of the time? It is Paul. And so it doesn't look very promising for Paul. Yet in the middle of that prison, he writes this most famous verse in the Bible. Don't worry about anything. Do you think Paul has a couple of tips for us concerning worry, concerning anxiety? You bet he does. And we thank God that he wrote his letter to the Philippians because we get to study it. Are you with me? Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 9. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. There's our verse. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then, somebody shout then. then. Okay, what he just gave us is a formula. And he's saying if you do these things, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. So six verses with about four to five steps that lead us to one wonderful promise the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, if you didn't catch last week's sermon, I'm just going to give you a quick review, but go back and watch it on our YouTube channel. We talked about point number one, because this, this, this uh, sermon I've divided into three parts. Point number one was celebrate God's goodness. How can we rejoice in the middle of anxious times? You focus on the goodness of God. You change your lens and you start believing God at his promises instead of believing Satan's lies. Because anxiety literally means, the Greek suggests, it means torn in two. And so if you're not sure what you believe, no wonder you're anxious. A double-minded man, James 1.8 is unstable in all of his ways. So we need to decide before we go through any trial, what are we going to believe? You can decide that today, no matter what you face tomorrow. You can decide today that you're going to believe that God is good. And knowing and believing that God is good is going to give you peace in the middle of your storm. Psalm 27, 13, I would have lost heart unless I had believed. Unless what? I had believed. I would have fainted unless I had Believe that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Today I'm going to talk about point number two in this formula that Paul gives us on how to overcome anxiety. And it's this, refuse to worry. Refuse to worry. You begin by celebrating God's goodness. And because you know God is good, you can decide not to worry. Would you believe that the answer to your problems is found in letting them go? Worry is useless 
Because if you can do something about the situation, don't worry. Do whatever, it's, whatever you, is available for you to do. And if you can't do anything about it, why worry? You can't do anything about it anyway. And I know that sounds easy for somebody to just trivially say, you know, don't worry. It's like that man who uh, was just, you know, he, he was always downtrodden. And the people at work could tell he was always very heavy burdened and, and, and worried and anxious. And one day he got sick and tired. He's like, you know what? That's it. I'm done with it. And uh, he took matters into his own hands. The next day, people noticed the difference. He is upbeat. He is alive. He, he's got a big smile on his face. And people asked him, hey, what's different about you, man? You, you were always down, and now you look different. When one day to the next, he says, I got tired of worrying, and I hired a professional worrier to take all my worries and to worry <laughs> for me. And they're like, what? Uh, are you crazy? He says, no, no, no. I, I, I put out an ad, and somebody responded, and... Uh, and I'm paying them very well. How much are you paying for this professional worrier? I'm paying him $200,000 a year to take all my worries. He's got to, whatever I worry about, he's going to worry for me. And they're like, $200,000 a year? You don't make a third of that. How are you going to pay? He's like, I don't know. That's his worry. (laughs) But I like the thought of, hey, your concern is his concern. We don't have a professional warrior. We have a mighty God. And his concern or your concern is his concern. And he is more than able to help you through, to pull you through, to bring you out. You know, when my kids ask me to buy them something, they never ask how how I'm going to get the money. You know why they don't ask how I'm going to get the money to buy them what they want? Because it's not their job to worry. They have a father. It's his job to worry. It's his job to figure it out. And I'm here to tell you that you have a heavenly father. And you don't have to worry. It's God's job. God is saying, I don't want you to worry. Leave that to me. I'm not going to worry. I'm just going to do what I got to do. But when you believe in the goodness of God, as we, ex- as we express in point number one, when you believe that God is good, whether God's answer is a yes or a no or a maybe or a wait, because you know that God is good, that brings the peace of Christ to guard your heart and your mind. Now, I don't want you to think, though, that don't worry is my advice to you. It's God's advice to you. Paul tells you not to worry because Jesus tells you not to worry. Paul is only echoing what Jesus taught his disciples. Go with me to Matthew chapter 26, verses uh, 25 to 34. In these verses, you can have them there. We're going to study some of them. In this, in this passage, three different times, Jesus says, don't worry. Now, Jesus very seldom repeats himself. And when he does, it's because he's trying to drive home a point. He's trying to tell you, hey, you got to get this. So in these few verses, three times, he says, do not worry. And he gives us reasons why we should not worry. And so the rest of our message, I'm going to give you three reasons why Jesus says do not worry. This is point number two in our bigger message. But I'm going to give you three points today on why Jesus says you should not worry. Number one, because worry is unreasonable. Somebody shout it's unreasonable. I thought of, I've thought of saying it's insane, but I didn't want anybody to feel bad. It, but, but unreasonable sounds a little bit more diplomatic, right? Nobody wants to feel like they're insane, especially when we're talking about anxiety and depression and all these things. Uh, But but it is unreasonable to worry. Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore I say to you, now this is Jesus speaking, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? You see, the first thing that Jesus establishes is that we worry too much about the wrong things. He's saying, you're worrying about food. Isn't life more than food? Like, isn't life more important? And if I have you alive, if I have you alive, don't you think that I can provide for your food? We worry about the wrong thing. Don't worry about what you're going to put on. What clothes you're going to wear, isn't life more than clothing? You should be worrying about whether you're even going to be alive this morning to put anything on. 
And God is saying, but you didn't worry about that. You just got up. You just woke up. I gave you life. And if I've given you, the, if I've given you life, I'm going to give you whatever you need in life. True story. I have a pastor friend. They invited him to a pastor's meeting. And he says, he says Pastor, I'll never forget this, this experience. He says, we were in a pastor's meeting. And uh, they, they, they invited a bunch of pastors. And uh, one of these pastors, he, had, he was going through a really tough financial crisis. And uh, he, had, he had hitched a ride to the pastor's meeting. There was this businessman in the, in the pastor's meeting that had a brand new F-250 Ford truck. Brand new. Like literally he had dr driven it off the lot like the week before. And in the middle of the, of the meeting, this businessman gets up and he says, you know what? He tells this pastor, I feel from the Lord that I need to sow my new truck into your ministry. And he gave him the keys. He said, I'll never forget The pastor dropped the keys. He says, you're crazy. How am I going to put gas in that thing? <laughs> And everybody was left wondering what you're wondering. Like, wait, wait, wait. If God can give you the truck, you don't think he can give you the gas? And even if you don't think God can give you the gas, sell it. <laughs> I mean, do something, right? But... But when you worry about certain things, it, you become unreasonable. You start, you start thinking things that if you were to just stop for a moment and say, okay, okay, let me gather the pieces. Let me, let me put the puzzle together. Why am I even thinking this? It's unreasonable to feel this way. It's unreasonable to think these things. Now, check this out. Here's another example. Remember our first sermon in this series, the one about Elijah? And how he had just defeated the false prophets of Baal. He had just made fire descend from heaven. And the next moment, he is hiding in the middle of a cave. Why? Because Queen Jezebel had sent a letter threatening to kill him within 24 hours. 1 Kings 19, 3 and 4. Listen to this. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. Now, what was he? He was what? Afraid. And what did he do? He fled for what? For his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. He prayed that he might what? Die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. So he prayed that he might what? Die. But yet he fled for his Worry is unreasonable. You're fleeing because you're afraid of dying. But yet you're praying, God, I want to die. <laughs> That's what worry does to you. It's a lie. It messes with you. The enemy wants you to be confused. But God wants you to be clear about his goodness, that he will never leave you, that he will never forsake you, that the children of God never have to beg for food, that the children of God will never be ashamed, that the children of God will never be defeated. You are a child of God. Are you with me this morning? 500 years ago, the French philosopher Michel de Montaigne said this, my life has been filled with terrible misfortune. Most of which never happen. <laughs> That's what worry does for you. You play movies in your mind, in your head about what might happen, what's going to happen, what is bound to happen, what is inevitable, and most of it does not happen. In fact, a modern study backs up what Michel de Montaigne said 500 years ago. Dr. Joseph Garway concluded that 85% of what people worry about never happens happens 85 percent of the things that keep you up at night they never happen how many times have you thought they're going to take your car they're going to take they're going to take your house you know sometimes you're getting you're getting upset at the kids and you're disciplining the kids and they're yelling like a lion is devouring them alive and you're like that's it the neighbors are going to call cps and they're going to come knocking at my door and they're going to take my kids away and it never happened 85 percent Of the things you worry about never happen. And of the 15% that did happen, listen to this, in this study, 85% of the things that people worry about in this study didn't happen. And of the 15% that did happen, 79% of the people said 
that it was totally worth it that it happened because they discovered one of two things, either that they could handle the difficulty better than expected or that the difficulty taught them a lesson worth learning. So if you take the 85% that never happened and the 79% of people that said even the 15% that did happen is worth it, have I lost anybody? You come up with a number of 97% of what you worry over is not worth it. Let me say that again. 97% of what you worry over is not worth it. Dr. Galway concluded that worry is just the product of a fearful mind punishing you with exaggerations and misconceptions. It's the product of a fearful mind punishing you with exaggerations and misconceptions. Turn to somebody and tell them worry is unreasonable. Number two, worry is unhealthy. Worry is unhealthy. How many of you know that? I know there's a lot of research nowadays that tells us that, but Jesus knew that way back when. Verse 27, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? What's the answer? No. On the contrary, all research on the subject points to a different reality. Worry is toxic to your health. You know, when you worry, your body responds to anxiety the same way it would react to physical danger. This is where a lot of these side effects of anxiety come from. Because we have this uh, instinctive uh, response system built into the human anatomy uh, that, that researchers or psychologists call the, the fight or flight response. When you, when you have a perceived danger, you're either going to fight it or you're going to flee it. And to equip your body for action, because whether you're going to fight or you're going to flee, your body needs to be in top shape. Okay, you're going to have to be reactive. You're going to have to be strong. This is where adrenaline comes in. So your heart rate increases, your breathing becomes heavier, and you may sweat more. You become pale. Why do you become pale? Because the blood moves away from the skin and towards the muscles to help them prepare to either fight or to flee. This situation that, that has you worried has created this in your body. But many of the things we worry about today, here's the Here's the irony. Many of the things that we worry about today cannot be resolved by fighting or running away. So your body is getting ready to fight or run away, but you just can't figure out how to pay your credit card bills. You're not, you're not going to get your credit card. And you're not going to fight your credit card. You're not going to get your bill and say, ah, and start running away. So your body is preparing to fight or flight. But many of the worries that we carry do not, or are not resolved by fighting or fleeing. You got into an argument with your spouse. I mean, you're not going to, you should not fight them. Lord rebuke you. <laughs> we need to get you some help. Amen? Your, your, your sickness, your financial crisis, it, you, you cannot fight it. You cannot flee it. Yet your body, this is why Jesus is saying, don't worry. You're not going to add a single day to your life. Because you, what you're doing to your body is you're preparing it for something that it cannot do. It cannot fight it. It cannot flee it. So just don't worry. That's what Jesus is saying. Because your body has tensed up and it's ready, it's ready itself for the threat that you are feeling, those hormones, okay, are still circulating in the bloodstream. And, and this muscle tension can cause body aches, headaches, weak legs, tingling sensations, trembling. Some of you are like, man, no, I've been feeling all that stuff. This is where it stems from. Digestive problems. Never mind, your peace of mind is disturbed, making it harder for you to concentrate during the day and to sleep during the night. And over a prolonged period of time, raised levels of these chemicals can begin to have a toxic effect on glands, your nervous system, your heart. With excessive worry, church, our immune systems have little time to recover, so we become even more tired and more 
lethargic. Now, I'm going to stop right there because we're talking about worry, and now some of you are worried about your worry. (laughs) But all of this to say that worry is unhealthy. And number three, worry is unnatural. Worry is unnatural. Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly father feeds them. Now stop. They leave the verse up there. Look at the birds. They don't plant. Have you ever, have you ever seen a worried bird? <laughs> right? Like, have you ever seen a worried like, man, how, how am I going to get my worms today? How am I going to do it? <laughs> they don't worry. You've never seen a, 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 a bird just waiting for worms to fall out of the sky because they don't. They go and they pick on the soil and they, they find their worms. So whatever they can do about it, they do. But they don't worry about their sustenance. They don't worry about their survival. Because they have a creator God. Now, look at what Jesus says. He's speaking to the disciples. He says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For he didn't say they have a heavenly father that feeds them. He says, because your heavenly father feeds them. Which is important because... Birds don't have the kind of relationship with God that we do. We are God's prized possession. We are his children. And so Jesus is saying, if, if these mindless birds, if these uh, uh, birds that, that, that don't have a soul or uh, that don't have a relationship with God, if, if your heavenly father takes care of them, don't you think that he's going to take care of you? Aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Verse 30. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers, now these don't even have a heartbeat. If God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? You see, Jesus uses the birds and the wildflowers to make a point. He is saying, in all creation, the only creatures that worry are humans. Plants don't worry. Animals don't worry. We're the only thing that God has created that doesn't trust him. Humans. We're the only species that God has created that does not trust him. How many of you suffer from allergies? Raise your hand. How many of you like seasonal allergies or year-long, year-round allergies, allergy sufferers? Okay, we, I, you know, I, I'm an allergy sufferer too. I've, I've had a pretty good year, I got to say. 2010 has been, they've been good to me. Uh, but let me tell you something about allergies that you might not have known. There's research to suggest that your allergies may be a product of your worry. They may be a product of your anxiety. They may be a product of your fears. Because allergies are unnecessary reactions. They're the result of of a hypersensitive immune system. In other words, your body is having reactions that are far too exaggerated for the threat. So things like, uh, for example, uh, cat hair. No, cat hair is not toxic. Nobody's going to die because of cat hair, okay? Okay. Neither is wheat or milk or peanuts or pollen or dust. None of, these, none of these things are toxic in and of themselves. Dust is the perfect example because we were formed out of the dust, the Bible says. So being allergic to the very thing that you're made out of is counterintuitive. And it's contradictive to the creative order. Now this is funny, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody because I'm allergic to dust. Like if you get me in a dusty place and I start sneezing, my wife's a witness, I start coughing, I start sneezing, um, you know, and, and I start getting itchy. How many of you are allergic to dust? Is, isn't that crazy that we're allergic to the very thing that we are made out of? Like don't, don't do that to yourself because then you start sneezing and you'll start like, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. What I'm trying to say is that we should not be allergic 
to things that our Creator made for us to enjoy. We don't enjoy dust much, but peanuts and wheat and milk, those things are good. But the body misidentifies many of these substances as being harmful. And it sends far too many antibodies to the scene, bombarding it with a force much greater than required. And what the body is trying to do is fight or expel these things that are trying to get into the body. So these antibodies provoke symptoms like itching, sneezing, wheezing, swelling, congestion, diarrhea, watery eyes, a runny nose, all of these in an attempt to flush out the allergen. So the big question is, where did the body learn to overreact? And some research suggests that the body is only mimicking your emotional state, your emotional life, your emotional patterns. The body mimics our souls, the behavior of our emotions. Those of you who have small children, anybody here have small children? Do you have multiple small children? How many of you have like several kids. You can try this. See if it works. I, I might just, just be you know, lying to you right now, but this might, this might actually work, okay? This is, this is something that you, you got to look at. If you study your kids, think of which one has suffered more allergies than the other because there's always one that suffers allergies. There's one that is either less or, you know, or doesn't at all. Think of the one that suffers allergies more of your multiple kids, multiple children, Okay? It's usually the scaredy cat. <laughs> right? It's usually who, who, whatever kid is, is the more worrisome, the most fearful one, the, the scaredy cat. That's the one that suffered more allergies. Why? Because this particular research suggests that your body is only mimicking your emotional behavior. So if you tend to overreact to things emotionally, then your body is going to learn to overreact to things physically. Are you with me here, somebody, this morning? Amen. Psalm 91, verse 5. Here's the good news. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Why is this good news? Because we mentioned it earlier in the series, for 365 times God commands you in the Bible, fear not. You think that's a coincidence? I don't think so. Once for each day, God says, fear not. And then Psalm 91 verse 5 takes it further. Not only is he saying, you don't have to fear any day of your life. Here, we get to see that God covers a 24-hour period, emphasizing day and night protection. So not only does God give you a fear not for every day of the year, he gives you a fear not for every hour of the day. Did you know that fear is not God's will for your life? Just the way that you shouldn't suffer from allergies, but you do. You shouldn't worry, but we do. But when we understand that this is not God's will for our lives, we can begin to take action. We can begin to have faith. We can begin to believe that God has a greater plan for our lives. Did you know that fear was the most immediate consequence of sin? Go with me to the, to, to the Garden of Eden. Not, not literally, but let's go to Genesis chapter 3, <laughs> verses 9 to 11. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned? And the Bible says that before, before the fall or before they ate from the forbidden fruit, every day they would, they would have an evening stroll, a morning and evening stroll with God. Can you imagine walking with God, literally, in a garden? And so... The serpent comes and fools uh, Adam and Eve, and they eat, and they sin, and we, they disobey. And so their eyes are open, and, uh, and, and then God calls, calling them in the garden. And the Bible says that they hid from God. Check this out. Verse 9 to 11. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was what? Afraid, Afraid because I was naked so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Up until this moment that we just read, humans had never experienced fear. They had never experienced anxiety. They had never experienced worry. But we have been fighting it ever since. I'm here to tell you that worry and anxiety are a byproduct of our sinful nature. 
which we inherited from Adam and Eve. But we were not created for worry. Don't believe Satan's lies. You're not supposed to suffer anxiety. You're not supposed to suffer sleeplessness at night. You don't have to conform. You don't have to live in fear. And let me tell you why. Because the Bible speaks of that first Adam, but it also speaks in the New Testament of the second or the last Adam. And 1 Corinthians 15, 45, by the way, the first Adam is the one that sinned in, in the garden. The second Adam is the sinless Jesus, the sinless redeemer, the sinless son of God, Jesus. And it says this, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the scriptures tells us the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life giving spirit. He's a what? He's a life giving spirit. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Our old nature in Adam was, was, was one of sin and hence fear and worry came in. But our new nature in Christ is one of holiness, is one of healing, is, is, is one of redemption. And righteousness, our purpose in Christ is life and hence no fear. You know, two summers ago, I'm about to close. Worshiping can come up. Two summers ago, I got invited to uh, attend a very intense and, and personal uh, leadership seminar. And by intense and personal, I mean it was just me and the instructor, <laughs> And I got handpicked to, to, to take this course, and, and I had been looking forward to an opportunity like this. And in fact, they flew me in, and it was, in, 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 and it was an amazing experience for me, just as a leader. And uh, one of the objectives of the course was to discern the difference between who you are by nature and you, who you have become by nurture. In other words, God created all of us for a certain purpose. And the person God created you to be and the things that God destined for you to do may have been derailed by attitudes and habits learned by your upbringing, affected by your traumas and failures in life. And so at the core of everyone is somebody that was fearfully and wonderfully made for a divine purpose. Yet, we go through life, and there are certain things that happen to us, there are certain things that we do to ourselves, that will forever change the course of our path. You know, nobody is born evil. Did you know that nobody is, no, we, we, nobody is born a worry word? We learn. It, it's a learned behavior. And the good thing about learned behavior is that you can unlearn them. But we're a product many times of, of our upbringing, our past, our failures, our experiences. And so one of the objectives of the course was to peel back some of those layers to discover who I was at my core. And with, certain, uh, with a certain curriculum and certain surveys and questionnaires, they were able to determine this. They said, there's a phrase to describe you. Pastor Martinez, they said, you are an agent of change. This is what they determined. God called you to be an agent of change. And the instructor started to minister to my life. He says, God has anointed you to break strongholds. God has called you to change atmospheres. And he has gifted you to pioneer new normals. He said this, I don't know your church, I've never been to McAllen, Texas, but I guarantee you there are people in your church who have experienced growth for the better while sitting under your teachings because you are an agent of change. But with another study, they also determined that one of my greatest worries, that one of my greatest fears, one of the things that produces the most stress and anxiety in my life is change. And this is how they determined this. This is pretty interesting. So they had me, uh, they had me fill out a, a, a survey, and, and one of the questions was, what are, what are the most important milestones you've achieved in your life? So I had to write it out. And then I had to give them between, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, 
okay, on a scale of one to ten, um, how 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 that affected me emotionally. One being uh, sad, and and ten being you know happiest, right? And so, w whenever you've conquered a milestone in your life, what was the what was the the correlating emotion that you felt, and to what degree? And so, I wrote down some of the milestones, and obviously. In, in those milestones, I wrote the day I got married, and I wrote the day that we planted Vital Church. Now, there was other, there was other milestones, but I want to highlight these two. And so they asked me, okay, you planted Vital Church in 2003. And what was, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, how happy were you? I said, I was a 7. And they said, why were you a 7? I said, because I was confident that God had called me to do this. I was confident that God had brought us out of our old church, my wife and I, and that he had planted this vision in our hearts. I was confident about that, but I, I, couldn't, I could not write a 10 because I, was, I wasn't completely confident in myself. Would I be adequate enough to do the job, to get the job done? Okay, great. Another milestone. Um, the day I got married. On a scale of 1 to 10, how happy were you? Sorry, babe, I put 7. I wrote seven. And the, and the instructor says, the instructor says, wait a minute. This is supposed to be one of the happiest days of your life. Why did you write down a seven? I said, because again, I was, I was convinced from the moment I saw my wife, who was love at first sight. We dated. I knew from after, I knew we dated for six years. I knew after year one that she was the one for me. I knew that. But I waited so long, and even the day I got married, I could not be completely happy, not because she doesn't make me happy, but because I was fearful of myself. Am I going to be a good husband to her? Am I going to be able to provide for her? Am I going to make her happy? And so they start peeling back these layers, and they determine, Pastor Martinez, you are an agent of change, yet we've exposed that your greatest fear in life is change. You are resistant, even fearful, to new challenges and change, period. And he told me this. Isn't it contradictive of the way that God designed you to fear change, to stress out about change, to worry about change when you are an agent of change? And then he said some words that rocked my world, and I wrote them, I wrote them down because I didn't want to forget. He said this. If vital church has flourished with a fearful leader, imagine what God could do with vital if she had a fearless leader. That rocked my world. Why do I share that with you? Because you're not alone in your struggle with anxiety. Your pastors battle it too. And we struggle with change. And we get anxious. And we worry. But we're learning along with you. But that was, that was a, a, mo a breakthrough moment for me because it's been motivation ever since. I, I always imagined myself fearless. I imagine myself fearless. And I say, God. The things you would do if I was fearless. And you know what? I'm not fearless till this day. But I'm not as fearful as I was two summers ago. It's a process. It takes time. Can I ask you for a personal prayer? I've been hanging on to this for about, for a couple months. And I never told you guys. But it's tomorrow. So I, I, I covet your prayers. Um, there are doors that God, God opens. And, and you, you never understand all of it. Uh, and there's doors that you don't understand any of it. And uh, all I've understood from this door that the door has opened is that I need to walk through it. it. It might not have an immediate consequence, but I feel that eventually God wants me to walk this trail so that I know how to get there uh, when, when, when God gives me a specific assignment. But tomorrow, I'll be flying out to Washington, D.C. They've invited me to the White House. And I, I have no idea why. Um, I have, I have no idea why they called this fearful leader. Um, and, and, and I'm not really sure what, what the conversation is, is, is going to entail. But uh, they invited pastors from around the country. Uh, I believe 50 pastors. And um, they've extended this invite. And so we'll be flying out tomorrow. I pray that you, that you just cover me in prayer. Uh, we live in such a divisive time in our country. And no matter how you vote, I think we can agree that we need Jesus 
in America. We need more of God. And, and, and that we need to unite. And so we, there's conversations that need to be had. And uh, if God would use us in one way or another, either now or later, uh, that God would just, uh, you know, be with us. But uh, that wasn't part of my sermon. Just, I just put it in there. But I imagine myself many times as a fearless leader. And I want you to take a moment right now. I want you to take the next 20 seconds. And I want you to imagine yourself. Because, see, in your mind, you've gone through so many bad scenarios. Can you go through a good one right now? Can we do this little exercise for 20 seconds? Imagine yourself healed. Imagine yourself whole. Imagine yourself fearless. And think for a moment what God would do with a fearless Reuben, with a fearless Liz, with a fearless Anthony, with a fearless Smiley, the things that God would do with a fearless Rigo, with a fearless Brother Luna. What would God do with a fearless you. If you had perfect faith and if you trusted God in all of your ways, what would God do? Let this be your motivation. I want you to take, I want you to photograph in your memory this moment. What would God do with this fearless you? And let that be your motivation. Matthew 6, 31 and 33. So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek, therefore, the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. God will give you what? Everything you need. You know what Jesus is saying, right? Jesus is saying, leave worry fear and uncertainty to unbelievers they have every reason to worry they have every reason to be uncertain about many things but you you have a heavenly father who will give you victory in everything unbelievers worry about everything but you're secure in everything because you have a heavenly father and he's a good father. And he's a loving father. And he's an able father. He's an almighty God. And he is on your side. Can somebody stand with me this morning? Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to raise your hands to heaven right now. And open your heart. The altar is open. Anybody who wants to come forward. This has been a series where we have felt that the altar has been so important because strongholds have been breaking at the altar. Breakthroughs have been occurring at the altar. We, we, we love innovation and technology, but we're old school when it comes to the altar call. We still believe that God works powerful things at the altar. We still believe that when you come and surrender, when you respond to the word, that's what it is. An altar call is a response. The most immediate response you get to give to the word of God. And we believe that when you respond, God shows up. When you activate your faith, when you believe, things begin to happen. Strongholds begin to break. I asked you a few minutes ago to imagine a fearless you. But I declare and decree by the power of God and because Jesus is our healer and because Jesus is the lifter of our heads and because he's our portion and because he restores, I declare that a fearless you will no longer be just a figment of your imagination. I believe that with every passing day, as you are being built, as you're being molded into the image of the Son of God, Jesus, I declare that fear, anxiety, depression, stress, and worry will loosen their grip over your life. With every passing day, you will be more of an overcomer. With every passing day, you will experience more of the peace of God, securing your heart, securing your mind in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, right now, right now Father, I come before you. And I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for this church. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you put in us the conviction, the confidence that we need to trust in a good Father, 
in a mighty God, in a provider, in a healer.